Yeah. Frank Watson here uh, with Tom Probasco's Something to Say. Tom, how you doing? All right. All right, Frank. And you? Good. For yeah. I say good, but I still got that old back issue going right now. Oh, the back? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I feel for you because I had some kind of a thing. I think I was in, I'm almost 70 now, and I think I was in my 20s when I uh, did something that <clears throat> gets woken up every now and then. I never yeah. always, I never, you know, I, I guess I'm not being careful enough. And then, so that, uh, <laughs> I, I sympathize with you on that. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, yeah. What's for us today, Tom? Well, I thought what we do, we talked about this uh, uh, off camera last week. Uh, one of the arts things that I'm involved in, and, and you uh, know about it too, is the Indiana Music History Project, which was started 10 years ago by uh, Executive Director Rick Wilkerson. Uh, and in short, you know, what it does, it aims to collect all Indiana, and, and its geographic focus is the, the state of Indiana. Right. And uh, to collect and preserve um, music, certainly recordings, but also any kind of memorabilia related to concerts. Um, and the the... Now, it, there are various volunteers. There are different pieces of this. I'm most familiar with the collection of the music part of it, uh, the LPs, the CDs, the, the, the any any recorded music. Right. Uh, however, it's recorded, um, and so what we and you've known about. Uh, well, I guess since last summer. I got familiar, I became so associated with it, began to do some volunteer work. Uh, but then last week when we were talking about this, a specific case is your son, C.J. Watson, who unfortunately passed away in 2018, but he left a rich uh, legacy of, of uh, he, well, he, he played up here, got started, then he went down there and became well known in that part of the country yeah. uh, and continued mm -hmm. to write uh, perform and so the question that I had for you is uh, you know thinking about archives where is that material and you had said well you're not absolutely sure but he had a lady friend that when I first started talking about this stuff he well, before I got associated with the Indiana Music History Project, you told, I asked that question, where's this material being housed? Because at that time, I was still working with the library, and I had an interest in archives, generally speaking. So, well, probably, she probably has. It. So we got to talking about that. You know, what does it mean to have the catalog, you know? And, but then I... But then also, what is it? Um, that's one thing. But then the other thing is, is where will those materials be preserved for posterity? And that is what the Indiana Music History Project is about. Really, um, really briefly, Tom, uh, for people who are interested in knowing more about the Indiana Music History Project or volunteering, uh, how can they contact or or find more information. Yeah, if you if you just search on that phrase, Indiana Music History Project, uh, it will bring it. It will bring it up. It uh, it started out. It had a somewhat different name that Rick uh, Wilkerson, again the executive director, has kept. But probably about five or six years in, after he started it in 2014, he said, "You know, the main focus of this." is the Indiana Music History Project. And that's how he refers to it almost exclusively now. Uh -huh. But if you do that, search online, Indiana Music History Project, you'll see tons of information about it. Yeah, 
volunteer opportunities are available. It tells you how to get involved in that. Um, and as I say, uh, David Slates and I, you know, David, our, in fact, we'll go after we get done here, we'll go down this morning. Uh, the, the gallery for this place is just up the street where I live in the basement of the um, Flanner Buchanan Funeral Home. And it's there because Bruce Buchanan, like fourth or fifth generation leader of that or, you know, uh, itself a historic organization, uh, let them have space in the basement. They didn't need that basement space. That's, things have changed over time with the funeral industry. And so that's where we have the permanent gallery at, at this point in time. So David go, and I go down there and work on inventorying uh, the materials that have thus far been collected to get it ready to go to the shelves to be later cataloged. So there's a lot of steps, a lot of work to be done. And uh, and so that, in short, you know, so, but you can see all about this if you go to Indiana Music History Project. Okay. Uh, you'll, you can see Thank it all about, yeah. So that's how we got, you and I were just talking off camera uh, last week about, okay, here's a specific exa example, C.J. Watson's material. Right. And you said, well... Maybe this is what's going on with the catalog, uh, just in terms of somebody. I, I don't know if they're still, you know, if somebody wants to use the songs or something like that. But in the case of preservation, that's a different topic. You know, where will the material reside to be preserved mm -hmm. as they say, for, pros for posterity? Well, I, uh, I, I can... There are two different owners of uh, parts of CJ's catalog. And, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I will uh, I will reach out to them and, and see uh, if they uh, are interested in, in pursuing that. Uh, and one is his significant other. Uh, And uh, the other is his mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll I'll reach out to them and see what they have to say about it. Yeah, and and get back to you. And, yeah, you know I I think about that and I think about some of the great musicians that I've known in Indiana. Uh, one of which uh, down in the Bedford area. Uh, uh, that general area. See, it wasn't, it was Bedford, Bloomington. He played around that area. He had played, yeah. uh, <clears throat> he had been uh, with a group that played statewide uh, oh. also. But Butch Miller, and he took me to some wandering, wonderful fiddle, uh, fiddle gathering uh, oh. at somebody's house. And these guys were playing these really traditional tunes. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we did, uh, I played harmonica with him for a while yeah. and uh, we played some barbecues and, and uh, our just uh, extended family gatherings, people that were followers of his. Just this is when you lived in, uh, so this is when you lived uh, in Green in County? Sun yeah, in Green County. Okay. And um, uh, Butch, Butch was a guitar master. I mean, he was just an outstanding player. And um, it would really be wonderful to get players of that caliber, especially uh, uh, some sort of a record of them. Yeah, uh, and, yes. and see, that that's exactly the kind of thing uh, that we're talking about. Uh, the trick is, is where is the material? Now, I, it sounds like you knew him many years ago and yeah. probably lost track of him. Yeah, I, I lost track of Butch. Uh, yeah. But uh, he, was a, he was a great guy and a great musician. Yeah, that, that would be... Um, 
and you probably don't the, the way I hear you talking about it, I've known you for many years. Uh, it doesn't sound like there are known connections at this point that you, the people you could even ask. No, I'm, I'm, I've been gone from there for quite some time. Yeah. Well, I know some people you kept in contact with, they got, kept in contact with you, but this fellow's name is Butch Miller. Miller. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I don't know. I haven't, uh, it's one of those things I want to, you know, how sometimes you can do a search and things show up. You never expect. Um, do you have any notion whether he is still living or not? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, his his first name was Luther. Oh, as I recall. Uh, okay, I'm gonna <laughs> if I got that right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he went by Butch. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's all good to know. It's he uh, he had a bass player named Round Man. And round man was round, you know. Oh, he, funny. And uh, uh, and Bush loved to take uh, popular songs and uh, twistify them. He he would do uh, parodies. <clears throat> oh, that's funny. Uh, a lot of humor and and what he did, but he could he could do the song straight up and straight from the heart and. And uh, just a great, oh, yeah, yeah. So he did parodies, funny things, and then he wrote songs that he wrote a few songs. Um, uh, and uh, uh, he was he was more of a, a performer than he was a writer, uh, okay. But he was a he was a, a a good singer and a very, very smooth guitar player. Okay. He and I think you were, yeah, go ahead. He what? He could just do a lot with the guitar. And it sounds like his performances were not necessarily in uh, venues so much as. Yeah, he would, he would play, he would play, uh, some venues, uh, you know, like a, maybe an American Legion or, or something. But this is Southern Indiana. Yeah. And unless you're hooked into the college crowd or, oh, uh, you know, uh, going for a, uh, the country audience tended to American Legion or Lodge Halls or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and he didn't like uh, to be around people that were drinking a whole lot. So. Oh, yeah. Well, that this is exactly this is a good example, Frank, of the kind of thing that I mean. It, like I said, he, uh, we're looking for music, all genres. You know, the geographic focus again, Indiana, but all genres through time. From the beginning, however, that gets identified all the way up through present time. But see, that's the importance of identifying that kind of thing before it slips away from any living person's memory. Uh, and you know, so you feel a sense of urgency. One does. Uh, and I remember when Rick, you know, you and I met with Rick last. Mm -hmm. It's been a year ago, over a year ago. And he said, he said, I'm not young anymore. I want to be sitting on the front porch with my feet up. He said, nobody else is doing this. And so he felt compelled to do it. And it's a massive task. It is. But, but, that's, a, but that's a perfect example of the kind of thing. Uh, again, it gives me the sense of urgency uh, to get the word out there. And I carry those cards that Rick had printed up with me. I take them everywhere I go. Anybody that'll, you know, I think might be interested, you know, I always bring it up because the more people that know about it, yeah. the greater the chances that these things will be 
not lost. So, yeah, uh, so someone, uh, it would be a really good thing uh, for someone to uh, reach out to Stanley Smith. Uh, Heard you mention Stan Smith. Yeah, he's a, a songwriter, gu guitarist, uh, uh, and uh, oh, did he play? Did he play the I was just getting ready to say, did he play the clarinet? Yeah, yeah. or does yeah, he? He uh, he was around uh, playing around the old hummingbird in Indy. Oh yeah. And uh, he ended up going down to Texas. Oh, I remember you saying that. Yeah. And, of course, they had a, a much, uh, much stronger uh, local music scene down there. Yeah. That's why so many Hoosiers wind up leaving. Well, like your son, CJ, like my son, Chris. In uh, Indiana, Indiana is a, a, a really a, a difficult place. I th I think it is for a lot of musicians, especially yeah. the the songwriters. You know, uh, the the venues that are available are uh, are for people that want to come in and hear a live band play what they heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. pretty much like they heard it on the radio so they can dance to it yeah and have a couple of drinks and yeah and, uh, uh, yeah I'd have to say that the the uh, the audience in Indiana is is not as artistically uh, appreciative of the artist uh, yeah they they like, you know, in terms of songwriters and in terms of uh, music that's that's not uh, popular on the radio or on 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 the internet or whatever. And, well, and there, are, there are other places that are, are much friendlier uh, to music and to musicians. And yeah, the creative. Uh, you know the songwriters or the the um, master uh, musicians who do uh, tremendous performances of of their work or others. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, I, it's it's just the particular nature of Indiana, and I. Yeah, well, that's interesting to hear you say that because. Um... I, I, Julia and I have not lived in Broad. We live in Broadrip, but we have not lived here. It's, um, it's a little over three years. Yeah. And old, you know, people that have either lived here now and lived here for years or lived here and left say, you know, it's just not like it used to be. And that's kind of what they're referring to the music scene. Yeah. Uh, lacking what it once had, which is what I hear you describing. Uh, you know, original music, the uh, appreciation of the artistic, you know, talent. Now, there was there was that, and a lot of it was centered around Heron um, School of Art in the um, uh, Talbot Street area, mm -hmm. um, south of here. Yeah, yeah, you had a, a theater there, yeah, um, for live performance. Yeah. And the hummingbird was was housed there, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, and then Broad Ripple uh, had uh, several had more of the rock and and that um, yeah, uh, but still more appreciation of the local talent, right? Uh, not uh, all covers and so on and so forth. I well. And it's it, it, listening to you talk about that, you know, there's still things that I find, but they're, you know, like, OK, so like, for instance, Joy and I went and heard uh, a duo. Actually, there was more. They call themselves the Half Step Sisters. Oh, yeah, they're great. 
and they played some you know original music had some covers but a lot of original stuff and it was part of the the parks department so we were over at the um we were over at the broad ripple park and you know they were set up uh, you know yeah covered uh, structure there uh and so you still have that kind of thing but it's that's it's, to hear people who've been here for years that's a diminished you know availability of venues yeah um, compared to what once existed so you know i think that's all part of what you're what you're talking about and like i said we both had sons who uh, did the best they could around here uh, son chris probasco had a following with a band called goliathon but it, it was limited you know he just it, you know people were just like he had you know they would there were groups that would come but it, it limited there was limited if you were looking to launch and be a, the next big band uh this just like cj they just said okay i'm going to nashville yeah and, yeah uh, so that's a you know and and i'm you know i'm not uh for for a while i was kind of critical and, and of and uh not happy with the, the nashville and uh and i realized it you know nashville is nashville and and there's it's a wonderful place for musicians, people who really love music and love to all aspects, both the performance and the writing and the business of it. Uh, yeah. it and it's, it's, uh, my upset is not with Nashville. My, what I wish is that we had, a, a stronger local music scene yeah uh, where uh we generated um uh enough work for for paying the artists and yeah and uh, uh had the uh, a stronger uh marketing of of local recordings we've got some We've got some people that do uh, great work in terms of recording. Yeah. And um, um, uh, I, I just would like to, to see it thrive. Right. Yes. Well, and, and that's, uh, there's a fellow, some of our listeners here would know, Kyle Long, uh, does the cultural manifesto uh, WFYI Rick and Kyle know each other uh -huh. uh, but that's what he's about is uncovering the rich history of music in Indiana yeah so if we're not thriving now we certainly didn't lack for talent right uh, that's what the uh, Kyle long does with cultural manifesto. That's what Rick hopes to uh, do in terms of preservation and promotion, to some degree, but certainly preservation of uh, the local, well, state wide music. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, and there were there were labels, you know. Uh, just one comes my Lamp Records. I mean, there were there were uh, excellent. Recording studios in the state of Indiana, historically. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I I look at people like the Wright brothers and all that they accomplished with their with their music and. Yeah, you encountered them at the down at the uh, Sycamore. At Reserve. Sycamore, yes. yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. Great, great guys and. Uh, and and they get they get some due respect uh, amongst the the people in, in uh, Fishers and Castleton and yes uh, they're 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 still fairly fairly high profile but but in some ways 
you would expect them to be better known. They toured nationwide for many years. Uh, they were in a movie with Goldie Hawn. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but they didn't play locally, so they didn't develop that, that strong local base. And, yeah. And, and probably the strong local ba base likes songs like Wagon Wheel or uh, uh, Free Bird. Or, mm -hmm. You know, they, they're, uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a, in some ways, it's a function of just population numbers and how many people you got to draw on. But, but they feel, you know, they they feel uh, the big venues with uh, national acts coming through. So, you you you've got people that are really keyed into uh, the media, the national. Yeah the national media. Right. Yeah. Well, I remember regarding the Wright brothers, they were kind of a a group that sort of uh, didn't hit the big, big time. They kind of went, you know, got, did get some recognition outside of the state. Uh, I first became, well, I, you know, I probably heard something they did on the radio back when I was a kid listening to yeah. what used to be called country western eventually just called country um so they they did have some broader recognition there was a um, this reminds me there's a friend of Julia's a friend of mine too Mike Harding owns uh, the Pixie Theater down in Edinburgh yes CJ played there well there you go and uh and, and well, by now it's but it's back to the you know Mike and well actually Mike and his brother on it they do events there they do uh, uh, music but it's it's been a struggle uh, and so so much so I think Mike might I don't want to tell tales out of school here but I think he's might be looking to sell it but uh, for years you know he worked on uh, trying to get people in, in the seats. And he'd get some, but there again, there's, you know, Edinburgh, you know, it was built as a theater. It wasn't ever anything else, I don't believe. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, Joey is behind me here, it says Tim Wright is a regular there. In fact, we, many years ago, Joey and I heard some of the Wright brothers at, at, at the Pixie, uh, but Tim is a, a well, because Mike knows him, Mike Harding, the owner, uh, and his brother, owner of the Pixie, know him, and, and he plays there uh, quite a bit, I think, uh, as a as a solo act, I think. But I, I saw some of the Wright brothers with Julia a long time ago. So, yeah, the Pixie, there's, you know, but that's that, again, is the what you've described, the struggle of. You know, it's it's everything has to be. You know, anytime the anything becomes an industry, music industry, then it tends to get homogenize. Uh, people want to hear the same song over and over again, and those songs are kind of like, you know, what is that? Why the attraction? You know, I'm asking myself, um, but. It gets promoted. It gets it tells people this is good. This is what you want. Yep. Then it's pretty homogenized. It it just breaks my achy breaky heart. Achy breaky heart. It's kind of like farming, you know. Years ago, this is what Wendell Berry talked about. They uh, got to a point. They said, "Get big or get out." So the decline of the family farm started in. And I yep. see parallels uh, to that. But to anything that becomes an industry, uh, it's about the money. Well, it is. And, and uh, 
at the same time, there's there's house parties and house concerts all over the state. Yes, uh, my the guys I play with played at the uh, called, place called the Music Room, and a number of years ago, I just for other things that were going on, two thousand nine uh, was the first house party I ever attended, and they were not common then, but they've become more common. So it, it's interesting that you bring that up because there are other things that um, are coming about for those who want to hear uh, not the latest and greatest uh, because at at the one we played at, we played a couple covers, but we played an awful lot of uh, original music that our group had written. But that's a good example how uh, kind of pushing back against the tide is these are these house parties. House, you know, venues. Tom, we're at ten o'clock. How long do you want to go? With, with well, we had talked about thirty minutes being sort of a probably um, as much time as most people are going to want to spend doing something like this. So I suppose um, we probably ought to um, stop now. Well, is there a particular message or? inspirational thought or anything you want to end up with well i do i just kind of want to got something pulled up here i don't on the screen here there i go um yeah i um i mainly want to leave people with the idea of, of looking at that of the Indianapolis history project try if you get a chance go to that and look at it Indiana Music History yeah, Project. Indiana Music History Project. If you uh, search that phrase, it'll come right up. Uh, and just be aware of the uniqueness of that, because there really is nothing like it, certainly in this state. Um, I don't know. In other states, does it exist? I don't know. But uh, as Rick said when he started this organization, he said, this is a massive project. I'd rather be sitting on the porch with my feet up, but he said nobody else is doing it. And Rick has that awareness because he owned two record stores. Right. So he knows, you know, and he looked around, you know, there's, there is some material in the state library, but that's not their focus. Uh, there's uh, Indiana, the uh, historical, Indiana Historical Society. There's some material there, but that's not their, you know, they, they collect broadly. So, this is a unique thing. The, the History Project has, has volunteers who are cataloging music, and they also accept donations of posters or uh, albums. Memorabilia related memorabilia. To, you know, to, to shows that have occurred um, and posters. I mean, we've got some of those. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and then and if you have a urge to, to volunteer, uh, we need, you know, we've got a, we've got a handful and we need a, you know, we've got a, I don't know, you know, we've, we've got a, a platoon. We need an army <laughs> to get this done. So, yeah. So take a look at it. So and, Uncle Rick wants you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay, right. Tom. Well, we'll start in on something else uh, the, with uh, something to say. Uh, a week from today. Well, the one thing we didn't do that I would like to do is to, to kick off each each program with a little bit of original material, preferably from you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to do that, but I wanted to get that out there and uh, about CJ and the Indiana Music History Project. So we will do that starting next week. All right. Well, Tom, you have a really good week. All right. Thank you, uh, Frank. You do the same. We'll be looking forward to next week. Yes, sir.